Um, okay, our next speaker is Avital Sternin. Um, Avital is in the second year of her PhD, uh, working in my lab and in Jessica Grant's lab at Western. Um, today she's going to be talking about her master's work, which was also done in my lab and Jessica Grant's lab. Um, and what Avital didn't know until she got on the plane yesterday is that um, this meeting partly is only taking place because of her master's thesis. Um, in that, back in December when I last saw Robert, he said that he was thinking of doing some, um, starting some work looking at decoding um, uh, aspects of music and that we should talk about that because it's obviously related to the decoding work we've been doing with movies and things. And I said, oh, we have a student who's been working on that. Um, um, and the results were not uh, what I expected. And Robert said, well, we should talk about that. And then, um, we had this opportunity to have a workshop. So this is essentially us talking about that. So um, Avital is going to talk about um, her master's work. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Adrian. Um, yeah, so this is um, the, the title in the program is Classifying Music Perception and Imagination Using EEG, which was the focus of my master's work. Um, but since then, we've sort of added in the speech and rhythmic components. Um, and as I mentioned yesterday, because we had such a difficult time decoding the music, we, saw, we moved into other domains. So I'm going to uh, show some data from, from all, both of those experiments um, today. So uh, the paper that Adrian showed yesterday um, from 2003, I believe, um, had, that Adrian had people um, imagining music um, and trying to, to decode that um, from the EEG signal. Um, my project sort of became an ex extension of that uh, work um, and to try and further that research using music as a, as a driver of BCI. And so the idea behind um, this particular project was to um, go beyond the, the binary um, uh, capabilities that the current BCIs have, so beyond the idea of uh, answering a yes or a no question. Um, there's a lot of music at our disposal. Um, people listen to many different kinds of music, so can we capitalize um, on the, diff the temporal differences in music um, as captured by EEG to drive a BCI with more than two uh, solutions? Um, so the idea here would be that um, you know, we could ask a patient how they're feeling today, and uh, compare their EEG output to some pre-existing templates in order to determine that this patient feels happy today, sort of as a simplistic idea. Um, some previous work has shown that it's possible to identify music that is perceived, so music that is listened to, and Rebecca Schaefer did some work where she had um, patients, or participants, excuse me, um, listen to seven different types of melodies, uh, and using the time course of uh, the first independent component from her analysis, um, the, the time courses were unique enough that they, she could classify which stimulus a participant was listening to um, with a relatively high accuracy, 70% here. Um, so this is, this is great that we can do this with uh, perceived music, but you can't drive a brain-computer interface um, using perception, so we needed to move this into imagination. And there's some work that's, sh that's shown that the um, brain areas responsible for music perception overlap with those areas responsible for imagination. So um, based on, on these two uh, pieces of the puzzle, we thought, okay, maybe we can drive our BCI with music imagination. So uh, the, the first project of my master's uh, work used 12 different uh, very familiar pieces of music, so things like Christmas carols and um, nursery rhymes. Um, each stimulus was about 10 to 12 seconds long, um, and they were presented to participants under two conditions. Um, the first condition is what we called cued perception. So participants heard a metronome cue, so four tones, um, before the onset of the stimulus, and this was to cue participants to um, the tempo of that stimulus and uh, sort of they could expect when the stimulus would begin. In the cued imagination condition, um, the tempo cue was identical, but then the stimulus wouldn't start, and we asked participants to imagine that piece of music um, just as they had heard it in the perception condition. So at the time, I was working with a, a postdoc in the lab who had a, was very interested in machine learning, and so we took a neural network approach um, to try and classify our 12 stimuli. So I'll walk through how this uh, network uh, uh, just briefly how it works. So this uh, first layer of the network here um, 
was uh, trained using a similarity constraint encoder that basically maximizes similarities between like stimuli. Um, and uh, practically, it basically acts as a spatial weight on the 64-channel EEG data. Um, the output from that first layer gets convolved with the, the second layer, um, which is a sort of a temporal filter. Um, and during the training phase of this network, uh, the network learns 12 different templates um, that represent each of our 12 stimuli. So we have these sort of um, neural network templates or representations of our 12 different types of stimuli. And so when we input training data into the network, um, it gets processed by the spatial weights, the temporal um, con convolved with the temporal layer, and then the output of, layer, of that second layer gets compared against each one of these 12 uh, templates. And basically, um, whichever one it most closely resembles is how that um, test trial <laughs> gets classified. And so here I'm showing, uh, oh wow, you cannot see that. Okay, so well, what you can see is that what you would expect um, if we could truly uh, classify our data, you'd get a really nice dark line down the diagonal there, which is what we would hope. Um, but basically we, we don't see that. Um, we, can, we have an accuracy of about 30% at classifying our perception data, but there's a lot of confusion um, and it's the, the network is not able to um, very cleanly pull apart um, each, each type of stimulus. And the story gets worse, uh, well, it's basically <laughs> empty <laughs> with imagination. Um, it's sort of uh, shades of light gray on my screen here, but basically um, we're at chance or uh, at being able to classify these stimuli. Um, so this approach to uh, the classification of these stimuli just didn't work. Um, so one of the issues, uh, so, so we sort of took a step back and said, okay, well, what, what are some of the issues that we have with this data set? One big thing is that we probably don't have enough data um, because of the, the style of this experiment. We only have, um, I believe it's six trials per stimulus. So if you're dividing that up between tra training and testing, that's not a lot of data. Um, the, another issue is perhaps we have, uh, our music is too complex. There's too much going on. Um, each stimulus is quite different. Um, there's a lot of instrumentation. Some of them have lyrics, some of them don't. And so potentially there's just, um, it's just too complex for the, um, for the uh, network to pull apart. The other big issue that I think um, we faced in this data set was that our imagination wasn't constrained. Yes, we cued participants as to the tempo of the stimulus and when to begin, but there was no constraint on how quickly to imagine, when to finish, and so um, inevitably people were imagining at different rates. And so the next step that we did was to get more trials in a new experiment, simplify our stimuli, and incre increase constraints. And so that moved us into our speech and rhythm experiment. Um, so um, uh, what I'll do right now is, is explain a little bit about why we think we can pull rhythm and beat out of um, the EEG signal. So if you're looking, listening to a sound, um, this, this particular sound is just sort of a series of isochronous tones. Um, and you can see here that there is a, a beat that is occurring at a regular rate. In this case, it's at 2.4 hertz. And when you have people listen to this uh, stimulus, and then you look at their EEG signal, you can pull out of the FFT um, uh, that, that peak at 2.4 hertz. So the information from the stimulus is appearing in the EEG data. What they did next in this study was they had people impose a structure onto that uh, stimulus. So the stimulus is identical, um, but they had people imagine that stimulus occurring in groups of two. So rather than just hearing bop, 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 they asked people to imagine um, bop, 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 bop. And so they were imposing internally this structure. And so that, that rate of 1.2 hertz, which is the rate of every other beat at this point, shows up in the FFT, even though that that's not actually occurring in the stimulus they're hearing. And the next thing that they did was they had people imagine it in groups of three. So to, to um, emphasize every third beat at 0 0.8 hertz. And so you see that 0 0.8 hertz in the FFT and the harmonic at 1.6. But interestingly, the 1.2 from the previous structure disappears. And so we know from this that we can impose this um, imagined structure um, and, and modulate the EEG signal um, at particular rates. So this is really great, except that um, this brings us back to a binary problem. Now we have a yes or a no answer again, because we can imagine in groups of two or in groups of three. And so we wanted to expand on this um, ability to detect rhythmicity in EEG um, and, and use stimuli um, that might be easier for people to imagine than say just a series of rhythmic tones. 
Um, and so we thought, well, maybe speech is, which is inherently rhythmic and might be easier for people to imagine. Um, and so that's where we went. It also reduces the need for, I think this was mentioned yesterday, these proxy states. So um, in, as Adrian mentioned, um, when you have people imagining playing tennis or walking around a house, those imagined states are proxies for yes or no. But if we have speech, we can have people actually try and imagine some sort of a phrase to indicate um, consent or that they're in pain or that they're hungry, for example. Um, so it's maybe a little more of a direct measure. Um, and there's some uh, work to show that these, um, you can classify vowel sounds and rhythmic patterns from both heard and imagined EEG signals. So we sort of you, we use this as a jumping board um, and designed an experiment where we um, use rhythmic uh, tonal patterns and speech. So, um, okay, so in this experiment we had um, a metronome at 120 beats per minute, and then we created eight different stimuli that directly mapped onto that uh, metronome. So the bars here, the four sets of bars, are indicating the tones, um, and then the uh, words underneath are indicating the rhythmic speech phrases that directly map onto those uh, rhythmic patterns. Um, we also made them, um, we varied them on their key, uh, time signature, so we have sort of stimuli that are in 3-4 time or in groups of 3, um, or in 4-4 four, four time or in groups of 4, um, and just to, to try and see if, if um, in the analysis this makes a difference. Um, so these are just really short phrases that, can rep that get repeated. So we have, I'm hungry, that hurts, no I don't, and yes, I'd like that, as sort of a, um, as the speech phrases that we used. So participants heard those, um, or these stimuli for 12 seconds, and at the 12 second mark, the stimulus of the ryth uh, rhythmic pattern or the speech uh, turned off. Importantly, the metronome continued throughout the imagination period, and we asked participants to continue to imagine either the rhythm or the speech. Uh, and so the idea behind um, keeping the metronome there is to more tightly constrain the imagination, um, which we didn't have in the previous experiment. So our goal here was to detect and ultimately to classify these perceived and imagined uh, rhythms and speech patterns. So um, at the time, there was a lot of RCA going on in the lab, so we said, well, why don't we uh, try this um, on the data? Um, so uh, as was mentioned extensively yesterday, um, the correlational component analysis is similar to an, uh, like a principal components analysis, but the components are maximally correlated in time. Um, and so we were interested in uh, what do these RCA components look like for our stimuli, both spatially and temporally. So here we have um, the two, uh, the top, so the, these are the components that are responsible for uh, the greatest amount of correlation. Um, this is a, across participants. This is all of our participants together. Um, a perceived speech and rhythm for the I'm hungry trial. And you can see that the, the speech and rhythmic patterns are similar. And interestingly, you know, all of our perception components are similar, as well as all of our imagination components. So basically, for every single stimulus, um, uh, both perceived and imagined, um, there's, a, there's a similar, uh, similar things going on in terms of correlations across time. And that's actually not super surprising, considering that I sort of just mentioned that there's this overlap um, in the brain areas that are responsible for uh, perceived and imagined uh, music. So that's great. So we said, okay, well, now let's look at what those components are doing over time, over the course of that six second window. So here I'm showing you for rhythm perception for the first, uh, the I'm hungry trial. This is the time course um, of that first component for each six second window, for each trial, for each participant. So I think there's 150 or so um, trials in here. And then I can show you for all of our other uh, the, the other perceived rhythmic trials. Um, and what sort of jumps out here is that they are sort of unique looking. Each, each uh, stimulus has a unique time course. And if I show you the same thing for the imagination components, um, they look similar to the perception components, but the variance is much higher in imagination here. Okay, so then if I'm gonna now switch and show you the same thing for speech, um, we still see that there's um, sort of unique time courses, but for whatever reason, there's more variance in the speech perception than in the imagination. And I, I don't have an explanation for this. This is, um, this is what it looks like. <laughs> so then what we 
tried to do was to classify based on the time course of these components, because they do look um, different from one another. So we used a binary classification approach just to start off, to see can we differentiate two different types of our stimuli. So for example, the I'm hurt, um, that hurts versus I'm hungry stimuli. And so we trained and tested on different halves of the data for every possible pair, and our accuracy is at chance. We can't classify our data based on the time courses of the RCA. So um, I'm going to end there because we're not really sure what to do next. Um, and I do believe that the, the speech and rhythmic, uh, rhythm experiment, um, we worked very hard to tightly constrain it. So I do believe that the, there's something in the data that we should be able to pull out. We're, um, I'm guessing we're just not approaching it um, from the right way. So I'm hoping that you guys might have some suggestions as to um, where to go next with this data set. Um, so I want to thank my supervisors, uh, the Ledmer Foundation. This is supposed to say the brain and mind, uh, sorry, brain scan up here, but it's white on light gray, so you can't see it, um, and all of the funding agencies. Thank you.